back at ISTAT 2015, now with Steve Mason from CIT. Steve, what I would like to talk with you about is the issue that seems to be coming around and around, and it's been going on backwards and forwards in sessions here and in briefings and, and conversations, the 757 replacement. At your company's delightful breakfast this morning, that it came up again. Perhaps you can, for our audience, reiterate the position or your, the view at CIT about this this issue. Sure. So, so the 757 market, replacement market, may not just be a 757. Um, we certainly think the H321L or goes a long way to taking um, what the 757-200 can do in terms of range of payload and uh, performing well. Um, what we, where we think is an interesting market is the market that may be a little bit bigger than that. So it's kind of the market between the larger narrow-body aircraft and the smaller wide-body aircraft. So anything from you know an international two-class layout of about 180 seats all the way up to about 250 seats. So really, it's a 757-767 replacement market in our view, and that's what uh, we'll, we'll be studying in the next uh, couple of months. And how big do you think that market would be? So, so when you say 767, you mean like the 767-200 sized? Mm -hmm. So do you, you see a family potentially in there? So we do. So we don't see one aircraft. We think it's, it makes a lot of sense for the airframers to have at least two aircraft in that market. And maybe two is the most they can probably go. Uh, we've seen how simple it is to shrink and stretch an aircraft. The stretch economics are very powerful. So I think you may want range from a smaller aircraft in that market, and then you want to take that range away and swap it for payload for a little bit of a bigger aircraft, um, getting up towards the size of a 787-8 or an H. 3200, but not quite as big as those aircraft. This, in other words, where you have a 757-200-300, that same thinking, where they would one had more range and the other one had more capacity, That's but you would, you would slide the, the segment up north of 200 seats. Yes, slightly north of 200 seats. When we speak to our airlines, that's what we. That's the feedback we get. Is they need something a little bit bigger than the A321L or some of the airlines, um, and then you would get into a probably two family member, um, 757-200, maybe a little bit bigger than that, 757-300, maybe a little bit bigger than that. And the interesting thing about this market for us is that sometimes the airframers may need the seats to show that they've got the seat mile cost because there's going to be an additional capital cost for the aircraft. They're building a if they do something, they'll be building a brand new aircraft, and it's not cheap. You know, a developer program could be ten billion dollars, and so you may need to add seats to the aircraft. First of all, because your customers want them, but second of all, to provide seat mile costs that are competitive with either used aircraft or new single line aircraft. So the floor would be around two hundred seats. Where would you put the roof? Probably around two thirty seats. Um, I would say the floor is probably a little bit less than two hundred, but somewhere around the one ninety two class international layout up to let's say two twenty two thirty. So it fits squarely in between what we have today. So seven eight seven dash eight or an A three thirty two hundred is probably two hundred and fifty seats international two class layout, and you know an A three twenty one international two class layout is about one hundred and sixty four. So something that kind of plugs that plugs that gap. How much time do you think Boeing has to? study this market before they have to make a decision. Do you think Airbus puts pressure on them right now with LR? No, I don't. I think Boeing have plenty of time. I don't think anybody needs to rush into this market. The market is served today by both new and used aircraft in a way. So you have the A321s that are COs and, and NEOs in a few years. Um, and you have the A33200s new and used, the 787-8s new and the 767s used. So there's no need to rush into the market and Boeing won't rush, I don't think, is my opinion. because. There is uh, going to be a lot of analysis and question marks around what size the market is, if you'll cannibalize some of the larger narrow bodies and some of the smaller wide bodies. Um, and for that reason, I think they'll take their time, they'll, they'll gather their, their market intelligence and do their analysis. And um, I don't think anybody's in a rush to come out with a, with a brand new aircraft anytime, you know, soon, within months. I think, I think uh, in terms of a, a, a launch date, I, I wouldn't see anything happening this year, for instance. I don't think so. Any case could be made for making a 787-3 replacement or 787 light? Do you think that could be a, a consideration? I think it will be considered uh, in the end. Ultimately, I think uh, the fuselage is probably a little bit too wide for that market. Um, so you're pushing a bigger fuselage through the air, um, which will cost you, you know, a couple of percentage points in drag and, and, and therefore fuel efficiency. So I think... Um, I think you probably need a fuselage that's either a narrow body fuselage or maybe a little bit bigger where you have a seven abreasts twin aisle, um, twin aisle um, 
fuselage. And you know, you look at an A321 today, and I've been on them myself, a one class layout, and it takes quite a while to deboard the aircraft if you're using wooden doors. So I think there is certain merit behind having a twin aisle aircraft in this market space. Okay, before we go up, let's go down for a minute below the 757. Um, yesterday, Boeing and Airbus in their presentations both seemed to me to indicate that they were leaving or abdicating the space below 150 seats. It seemed to me, based on the presentations, that the 737, the 737-700 size and the 319-sized airplanes were so, sort of orphans. What's your sense of that? So for an airframer, you know, they're, they're, um, um, they have a family of aircraft. Um, and uh, my view, our view, is that to, to protect your market space, um, Boeing and Airbus will definitely go ahead with the A319neo if they're forced to. Um, they have orders for the A319neo and the 737-7 MAX. Um, so customers and big customers want the aircraft. Um, if those orders went away, uh, there was a campaign for you know 130-seat aircraft and Bombardier and Embraer and Boeing and Airbus were, were there. I think Boeing and Airbus would definitely um, uh, push their A319 and 737 models um, to try and protect that market space. So you, it's, you did not get, I mean, I would imagine you saw the same things I did. You did not get the sense that they're going to walk away from that segment yet. I don't think they're going to walk away. Okay, let's go up, up market then. Um, 330 NEO seems to have become quite a disruptive airplane and your company was one of the launch customers. Could you walk us through the thinking behind that airplane from your perspective? Sure, so so it's an aircraft we obviously like. We've ordered 15 of these and they uh, they uh, complement our, our order book. We have A350s, A330neo as an order, 787s in the wide body space. Um, the, the, the thinking that we went through is we when we, when we look at aircraft and we analyze aircraft, we look at three fundamental things. We look at the wing of the aircraft, the engine, and we look at the weight of the aircraft. And, you know, there are other aspects from, from an aerodynamic and performance point of view, but these are three aspects of the aircraft. There are other aspects from an aerodynamic and performance point of view, but these are three very important things. Um, the weight and the wing of the aircraft have been, have been home for quite a, quite a few years now. So the A330 platform has been out there in service for around 20 years now. Um, the wing, we believe, is one of the best wings that Airbus have ever produced, and they have a lot of knowledge around the wing. So it's an A340 wing, several model types. It's an A330 wing, of course. Um, it's used in the, the freighter and the tanker. So they know the wing very well, and they know how to hone the efficiency of the wing. And the engines themselves will be, will be uh, derivatives of the Trent 10. Um, old indications from Rolls-Royce and from Boeing is that the Trent 10 is, is going to hit their numbers um, on both uh, spec from fuel burn point of view and from weight. Um, and so those three things that I talked about, the weight, the wing and the engine, they, they all match up to, to, to something that means a, a very efficient aircraft. And that's a major part of it. The, the other major part is, is the capital cost of the aircraft. Um, when, you, when, you, when you combine the cash operating cost of the aircraft, you have to look at the capital cost, whether it's a lease rate, debt charge and the insurance charge associated with the aircraft. And when you add these up, the aircraft is very competitive with the new technology aircraft. Now it doesn't have the A330-900, it doesn't have the range of some of its competitors, 787-9 or even the A350-900, which you know, we wouldn't class as a competitor because it's in a different seat market. Um, but not all air airlines need that range and I'm sure you're familiar with, with uh, the average stage lens of A330s today and 787s where they're at and uh, we think it sits in quite a neat spot in the marketplace. We think the aircraft will be an excellent uh, North American to Europe aircraft. We think it will also be an excellent uh, intra-Asia aircraft as well. So when you talk about intra-Asia, that, that speaks a little bit to the 330R, or, right? The regional version. Right. That, that, that does not seem to have gotten any traction. Do you think yeah. that this eclipses that airplane? So it didn't get much traction. Um, I do think it does because this aircraft has a physical change to it, right? So there's a technical change to this aircraft. It's the engines, there's aerodynamic tweaks uh, to the wing and structure and things. So um, once you make changes like that, that adds value to the airline, I believe. And it, 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 takes, it takes down the operating cost. Um, a paper change to the aircraft, which was what the uh, A330 domestic and regional was, and you know, I think there was a few other changes, but mainly a paper change, taking down the MTAL, reducing landing charges and nav charges, you're still left with the operating empty weight of the aircraft being where it was, and you don't have the fuel efficiency of a brand new engine, um, you didn't have the, the, uh, the aerodynamic tweaks to give you, you know, better aerodynamics, better performance from the airframe and wing as well, so I think, uh, I think there's a uh, um, like strong market for the A330neo uh, in Asia. The Three seven eight sevens that you have, those are dash nines that you have on order. 
we have dash eights and dash nines. So, uh, it, the, in terms of the dash eight, the three thirty neo has to be quite disruptive to that model, right? Um, from from what sense? Um, you know, Economics. It, the, the capital cost has to be damaging to the seven eight seven dash eight market. Well, so so the seven eight seven had a had a quite a head start in the eight three thirty neo. Um, so they've they've secured almost a thousand orders for the seven eight seven. 787-8 has many customers, I can't remember the exact number they're in service today, but it's building up a customer base that's very solid. So once you've chosen your technology, your aircraft platform, um, it's quite hard to reverse that decision and go to an A330 Neo. So right. the way Boeing have protected their 787 customer base from the A330 uh, Neo, um, and you'll see reorders of the 787 from that existing base. Um, when you look at the A330CO, there's about 100, just over 100 operators more than half of those operators have not ordered new technology aircraft. And that was another fundamental decision we, we looked to uh, when we ordered the aircraft because we know eventually these guys, most of these guys, not all of them, most of these guys will want new technology aircraft. And the, the uh, efficiencies you have from having the, the, the same airframe spares, the same pilot network, um, um, the same um, technical records, um, and infrastructure to support aircraft is very powerful in, in, a, in a, an aircraft company. That will stand to Airbus when they're, when they're trying to sell the A330 Neo. If you look at the 787-8 and the 330 Neo, could you hazard a guess at market size for those two airplanes relative to each other? How, I mean, how I they guess, will play out in terms of well, yeah, I mean, for, like you point out, you know, there are some airlines that are going to want new technology, and the that and the attendant risk, mm -hmm. and there are the others who say we don't want that risk. We want the workhorse, which is the Neo. Mm -hmm. It's predictable. Airlines love every airline loves predictability. When you look at those two, what would you see a breakdown? Would it be 50 50? So, we don't have the numbers right now. What I will say is that I don't see a major skew towards one or the other. We see the because of this big customer base of H330 operators that have not ordered new technology, that is going to bolt to them. And the 787 also has an existing order book and existing customers. So I can't say if it's going to be 50-50, my gut feel is that it will be, but I don't expect any skew in the market. I don't expect an 80-20 skew or a 20-80 skew in the marketplace. Thank you.